Okay, whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Hello, everyone. My name is Dane Tubergen. I'm the chair of the uh, Board of Christian Education at uh, Naples UCC Church. I want to welcome all of you today to this presentation by Rabbi Dr. Rachel Mikva. Uh, I'm sure most of you heard her sermon this morning uh, and had and therefore heard some very uh, intellectually uh, tantalizing uh, ideas. Uh, first, a couple of housekeeping matters. Uh, following uh, Dr. Mikva's presentation, you will be able to ask questions. Uh, and we would encourage, of course, questions. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will find a list of buttons. Find the button that says Q and A, and you'll be able to type in your question there. There's another button that says chat room, which sometimes has been used, but don't use that today. Use the Q&A button. I'll get the questions and I will then relay them to uh, Rabbi Mikva. Um, one other important housekeeping matter is that uh, tomorrow at 10 o'clock, Dr. Mikva is going to give a presentation on uh, peace and justice uh, between uh, Israel and Palestine. And uh, we'll talk about the history of the conflict and uh, the current status of the conflict. So uh, I think uh, all of you will want to uh, hear that a very, very current topical presentation. Um, it's now my pleasure to uh, introduce the rabbi, Dr. Rachel Mikva. She currently serves as the chair of the Jewish Studies and Senior Faculty Fellow of the Interreligious Institute at Chicago Theological Seminary. Uh, as you might know, the Chicago Theological Seminary is a leading seminary of our UCC denomination. Uh, Rabbi Mikva has earned a degree at Stanford University and her PhD at Jewish Theological Seminary. She now teaches courses in interpreting the Hebrew Bible, history of Jewish thought, and appropriately for today's lecture, she teaches a course entitled Dangerous Religious Ideas in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Prior to her academic career, she was a congregational rabbi for about 13 years. About dangerous religious ideas, she has written, there is a divine standard but it has always been mediated humanly. Also, she says, we live with the breathtaking and terrifying knowledge that religious passion is a catalyst for great good, but all too often is wielded as a weapon. So let me present to you Rabbi Dr. Rachel Mekka. Thank you so much, Dan. Um... And thank you to my clergy colleagues, Reverend Doctors uh, Dawson Taylor and Deborah Kaiser Cross and Sharon Harris Ewing, as well as uh, Mary Lee Turk, who's a student at CTS um, and has studied with me, and to the Board of Christian Education, um, Megan Black and others who've helped to coordinate today's event. It takes a lot more work than it looks like on the little screen. So. Most of all, though, thank you to everyone who's here today to, for making some time to think and talk together. Since uh, it can be hard to listen to someone talking on Zoom for very long, um, I've broken my reflections into two sections, and I actually should have mentioned this to you, Dane, and I apologize. What I'd like to do is open up for discussion, the Q&A, um, after each of the two sections. So. Um, you can sort of judge the amount of time you want to save in the first block uh, and have an equidistant or an, equa, an equally long period in the second block. Um, the first block will lay out the basic thesis of my book, Dangerous Religious Ideas. Some of you have already read the book. Hopefully my comments will help to, reflect, to refresh and to clarify um, the key points while bringing other folks up to speed. And then in the second part, I wanna focus with you most specifically about the role of religion in the public square. It's something that keeps coming up in the book, even though it's not a book about religion in the public square, because it's an arena where the dangers of religious ideas matter. Uh, we'll build on the book to think about how better to navigate this shared space. 
So let's jump in. Um, teaching and speaking in religious communities, I kept bumping into two assumptions. One, I found in traditional spaces where people often worried that even asking critical questions would weaken faith, that somehow it was undermining it. And in more progressive spaces, people often imagined that they had already reformed their traditions enough so that their religious ideas were never dangerous. And I wanted people to reimagine, rethink these assumptions, to see the deep roots of self-critical faith that are designed to strengthen and improve faith, not undermine it, um, and to recognize that this work is never done because the minute we assume that all of the dangers of religion belong to somebody else's articulation of faith, we become part of the problem. So I started teaching a course, which is a great privilege of professors. You get to work out your ideas with bright students who engage the ideas in thoughtful and creative ways. And now I've written this book, arguing that all religious ideas are dangerous. Not only those that we would consider extremist, but even those we embrace, even those that stand at the heart of faith. And because most religious traditions have always understood this peril, they've transmitted tools of self-critique as an essential dimension of faith. The seeds for this work are planted deep in the soil of religious thought. They're designed for us to cultivate. Jesus is a great model of self-critical faith, if you think about it, as were the Hebrew prophets and the prophet Muhammad. Not everybody liked them because of it, because self-critical faith is hard and people often just want religion to feel good. But the traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the only traditions I know much about, they never abandoned this task of self-critical faith. And if we want religion to be a force for blessing in the world, which it surely has been as well, then this is work we all have to do. So I, I don't argue that religious ideas are more dangerous than other types because all kinds of ideas fall into this dialectical tension of danger and possibility. But when embedded in religion, there are several interesting dynamics that unfold, including the issue of ultimacy, right? The capacity to override other criteria, because this is religion, this is God, right? So other criteria for justice, goodness, um, the capacity to, 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 that ultimacy will deny evidence of countervailing ideas, say about the earth rotating around the sun or slavery's evil, or we are in the midst of a human caused climate crisis. Um, this quality was evident by the way uh, in the Capitol riot. We saw Confederate flags and nooses and Nazi tributes alongside Jesus saves banners and crosses and shofar blowing insurrectionists because religion helped provide a moral rationale for this white supremacy and the historical model of holy war. So the dangers of religious ideas um, include violence, obviously, but also emotional, psychological, and social harm. God is a good example of social harm, right? I'm not talking about the folks who murder people for having the wrong God. Let's focus instead on the fact that more than 40% of Americans and a higher percentage worldwide assert that you have to believe in God in order to be an ethical person. So if we don't trust each other based on what we think about the divine, that's dangerous for the social fabric. And to this day, atheists face daily assaults on their beliefs and find it difficult to get elected to public office in the United States. We also have theists in opposing camps on issues like reproductive rights, gun safety, tax policy, and a host of other divisive issues who frequently presume God's on their side, right? And heap moral condemnation on their adversaries. And God in this instance becomes more like an idol carved in our own image, a kind of a yes person or a yes man, if I can gender it, right? Who endorses our politics and our prejudices. So here's a personal example, because I do wanna argue, of course, that none of us are immune, right? So my own commitment to religious pluralism leads me, I acknowledge, 
to easily denigrate or dismiss those who feel certain that they have an exclusive and supreme grasp on God's own truth. But as an evangelical Christian colleague said to me, we can't always be the problem that needs to be solved rather than the person with whom you wanna build relationship. Which wasn't talking to me specifically, but I took this insight much to heart as part of my self-critical faith. Or since danger and injustice aren't universally perceived, let's consider gender issues. Um, there are traditional communities within the quote unquote Abrahamic faiths, which I prefer to refer to as the traditions of Abraham, Sarah, and Hajar, but that's a mouthful, um, that have particular practices related to women that progressive groups frequently consider oppressive, right? There are limitations on leadership, inequality in legal status, stricter requirements for modesty and clothing, restrictions on reproductive rights other religiously endorsed positions that are often experienced as dangerous. So we may feel that religious authority in these instances is suppressing the freedom of women and we will denounce it as a perpetuation of patriarchy. Yet, many women within the traditional communities affirm the value of these practices and the ideas that underlie them. So we could counter with an argument that this is internalized oppression but not without denying these women's agency to some extent. And in addition, we have to acknowledge that the gender critique often inadvertently, sometimes on purpose, that often inadvertently adopts tropes that are shaped by the legacy of colonialism, especially when it comes to critique of Islam. So even women who seek to reform aspects of their tradition often experience that the greater danger is in the society's politicization of their bodies and its marginalization of their tradition. We also carry a lot of dangerous residue without realizing it. My students are surprised when they realize how much of the New Testament's anti-Pharisaic polemic they've absorbed and how it's shaped their understanding of Judaism. Even though they know better, Right? They catch themselves denigrating the law as if it's contrary to the spirit, as opposed to a complement or a part of. And they assume that sometimes that ancient Judaism must have been very parochial and that that's why Paul like invented universalism, like Al Gore invented the internet. Of course, I recognize, I acknowledge, I celebrate the great good that religion has stimulated as well. So I compare this to fire something that in its variety of forms is responsible for great blessings, something we can't even imagine our world without, but also something capable of ferocious destruction. And it's not always the action of a sociopath. Sometimes it's accidental. Often it's something we justify as necessary for a greater good. And in the book, I consider several examples of this double-edged sword, this power of fire. Scripture can be both a sacred call to advance justice and mercy amidst God's creation and a selectively read authorization to vindicate our worldview and marginalize those who disagree. Chosenness and election can be an aspirational covenant to become worthy of God's blessing, an extension of it in the world, to celebrate faith in God's abiding love and grace, but at the same time, it can also be a claim of a superiority or exclusivity. Reward and punishment can seek to enact some measure of justice to discern meaning in suffering, but also encourages retribution and blames victims for their plight. So in addition to recognizing that the dangers are not found only in somebody else's version of religion, self-critical faith, requires that we recognize how the power to heal is bound up with the power to harm. One example I discuss in the book is the power of religion to form community, which simultaneously create, creates an other who is not part of that community. And in a small, what seems kind of harmless manifestation, we can think about our own congregations frequently this way, right? The, the more intimate and and wonderful feeling of belonging that you may have in your church, 
it might be that much harder for somebody coming in to feel like they belong, right? Um, it's just, it, uh, and sometimes it's in a subset, right? The Bible study group, right? How do you break into the Bible study group? Um, and we think we're being hospitable, um, but it doesn't necessarily change the feeling of how hard it is to come in. So we see this in scripture too, right? Because it is an eternally relevant text, a potentially positive thing, right? It also canonizes othering, perpetuating attitudes that were grounded in a particular historical context. And because it has the potential to guide our lives, people will wield it, um, wield the word against one another to justify their own worldview. You know, not only do I think you're wrong, God says you're wrong. But if we strip it of its power, then how can it do its transformative work for justice and mercy? So as progressive religionists, we sometimes like to excuse ourselves. I mean, we think that our interpretations must always be benign. And, and I wanna suggest that even if it's true, there's, a, there's an aspect of the new atheist critique that should give us pause. Um, it's very easy to critique the new atheist critique of religion because they're not experts in religion and they make no exceptions for progressive religion and their conviction that religion stands at the root of all the bad stuff in human history. David Hollinger's um, expression of, of the way that we as people of faith tend to respond as progressive people of faith is, can't they tell Methodists from morons? Um, and the answer is no, not really. They, or they could, but they don't want to, right? They see religion as this multi-headed hydra that spits venom into the body politic. Um, I don't believe that religion is separable for human, from human existence. Um, so even if they, you know, even if we agreed that we should just get rid of it, I don't think we could. But they see that we are participating in a project that does also simultaneously uphold some dangerous religious ideas. Uh, a couple other complications I wanna throw in the mix and then open to some Q and A. Uh, one is that it's important to recognize that some dangers might be desirable. Roman orators and poets condemned the Sabbath as a pernicious idea. They were convinced it would undermine the ethos of productivity that was at the heart of Roman achievement. Rutilius Namatianus called it a plague of ignoble sloth. I love this phrase, right? And today we live, and I mentioned this very briefly at the end of the sermon, we live amidst another culture that tends to value people based on their achievements and productivity rather than their basic humanity, right? So we may see now this substantial merit in challenging, a dangerous challenge to this kind of materialistic standard of value. And since Sabbath promised rest for servants as well as their masters, the egalitarian commitment was also had something to do with early Roman suspicions. And in that regard, we would surely celebrate religion's subversive power. So we don't consider the Sabbath a dangerous religious idea, I don't think, uh, today. But the polemicists weren't wrong in thinking that some of the most important teachings can seriously date destabilize society. God's commitment to free a people from slavery, right? We had to fight a civil war and then, a, you know, and we're still working it out um, and it's still destabilizing. Uh, redistribution of wealth every 50 years to ensure that there won't be a permanent underclass. Dangerous ideas come in all shapes and sizes and some we embrace. The capacity within religious thought to imagine a world that's different than the one we live in, a world transformed or transcended, that's surely a vital source of its power. So these complexities make it all the more important to recognize and activate the self-critical capacities of our traditions. And it's worth examining how this was done. I spend a lot of the book doing this, but <laughs> we'll make it short here. Um, and we'll stick with the example of scripture. Because alongside the commitment to scripture as sacred texts that would guide our lives, long before the rise of historical criticism that would view scripture as the work of human hands, there was in our traditions an awareness of multivocality in scripture and in its interpretation. 
So think about the Gospels, right? It's, each one is titled the Gospel according to, and they don't agree. And we've canonized four of them, and more of them existed and circulated. And all of that canonization process was some kind of compromise, right? Among which one, which which will be our official tellings of this central story of Christianity. Or in Muslim tradition, there is a great um, hadith, uh, a collection of traditions around things that um, that the Prophet Muhammad was was uh, witnessed as saying. Right? So um, he told a story of receiving uh, the Quran in one version, one one harf, and bargained with the angel Gabriel to get up got as high as seven. He said he wanted to make sure that he had whatever version might speak most powerfully to whoever it was who would hear it. So he had memorized seven versions of Quran. Um, again, not wholly different, but speaking differently. Um, in Judaism, there's uh, an understanding that this multiplicity is divinely intended. Uh, there's a long-standing debate between the schools of Shammai and Hillel, um, uh, and, um, and finally a, a heavenly voice comes out, at, is recorded as being coming out at, in one of their arguments and saying, Elu elu Elohim chayim. these and these are the words of a living God. Right? This is divinely intended multiplicity. Um, and the rabbis decided that the practice would be according to Hillel, because Hillel, the students in the school of, Hill, of Rabbi Hillel cited the other opinions first and with respect, um, demonstrating respect for those with whom they disagree, demonstrating that our adversaries are often those with whom we partner in the pursuit of truth. So there's also in our traditions, humility about the limits of our understanding. Augustine and Nicholas of Cusa spoke about learned ignorance, another great phrase to just wrap your mind around. There was uh, a lot of thinking and writing about the provisional nature of truth that we're seeking truths to live by. We're seeking faith, not certainty. Um, uh, Intasar Rab, a, a modern Muslim scholar, she wrote about um, the historical value that Islam has placed on doubt, doubt as a critical component of faith. Um, and also a lot we can see within the traditions of consciousness of historical change and its impact on the meaning of scripture. Here I'll, I'll again cite a rabbinic tale because it's one of my favorites where Moses shows up in the classroom of Rabbi Akiva, a first century CE uh, early sage uh, in the rabbinic tradition. And he doesn't understand a thing. So he has to sit in the back, which is like the place where the newbies have to sit because he doesn't get it at all. And one of the students further up asks Rabbi Akiva questions. He says, Rabbi, how do you know this? And Rabbi Akiva answers, it's from Moses on Sinai. Right, it's a, this wonderful affirmation that this is an authentic continuation of that received tradition, but perhaps so transformed that even Moses himself wouldn't recognize it. Um, so this consciousness of historical change. So I fill over 40 pages unpacking all that related to scripture in the book, but that's the gist. Uh, collectively, these tools of self-critical faith have the power to mitigate some of the dangers of scripture. Not unfailingly, sometimes the tools themselves can be used in hurtful ways. But I think the historical models of self-critical faith matter because they demonstrate that this is not some tool of secularism bent on destroying religion, but built into our spiritual inheritance. And it's not the exclusive property of progressives or a single tradition. And the work is never done. It's the foundation for deepening faith and the glue for holding together a diverse society. So I think this is a good place to pause for some discussion. All right, <clears throat> um, if there are questions, excuse. All right, now, <clears throat> if there are questions then, uh, if you would type them into, uh, check the box or hit the box that says Q&A and type your questions. Uh, 
uh, and we will hopefully have a good discussion. Uh, Rabbi Mikva, <clears throat> I, I'll start because <laughs> I have a question. It seems to me that religious ideas are dangerous because people believe that particularly scripture is the inerrant word of God. What, what they've been taught is what God says, and that somehow gives it more power than this is what I believe. Is, what do you think about that? <clears throat> so one of the reasons I begin with the long history of self-critical reading of scripture is you can still believe it's God-given and recognize that you cannot extract the human dimension of its understanding. Um, and um, uh, I'm blanking on her name. Oh, Dawn Moon um, has done some uh, research. Did I mention this? I think I did in the sermon um, about, you know, we think that we're letting God's word shape us, but in fact, we've taken our worldview and we apply that to how we read scripture. So we can't extract ourselves. And so what the traditions long before the rise of self of, of historical criticism, long before people started saying this is a human text, and even for those today who still think it's a divine text, you can't get rid of the human element in the way that you read it, in the things that you focus on, in the way you interpret it. Um, and in fact, all the religious ideas that we now consider sort of central were always contested. Um, you know, a lot of central Christian dogma was debated and then voted on in, you know, in historic councils. They were not unanimous. And some of the decided positions, there still continued to be minority um, teaching moving along. Um, so, and those were based on interpretations of scripture. So, we just can't get rid of the human element of it, even if you think it's God breathed. Okay. Um, another question then, how do we have conversations today when we're so polarized in faith and politics? That'll be a great transition question <laughs> to part two about the place of religion in the public square. If there are other questions, let's do them first and then we'll come back to that one. All right. Um, thanks, uh, Rabbi Mikva, for your thoughts. Would you comment on whether you see dangerous religious ideas in the Decalogue or the Sermon on the Mount? Um, so, uh, yes. I mean, again, because dangers are not universally perceived. But um, uh, so let's start with the Roman perceptions about the Sabbath. Right. Or the first one, I am Adonai, your God, right? Because I've already spoken about God as a dangerous religious idea. I think they're all dangerous, right? So the answer is always going to be yes. Um, uh, the, um, you know, another interesting manifestation of the dangers of the Sabbath, more contemporary, you know, in ultra Orthodox neighborhoods in Jerusalem. Um, if you try to drive a car through them, you you can get your car can get stoned, right? That that they're so incensed about your violation of the Sabbath, they will be violent against you, right? So, um, you know, there are some that say, you know, the commandment against adultery or the commandment against um, uh, why can't I think of the English word? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, covetous, covetousness. I, was, I had a couple Hebrew words for it, but I couldn't think of English. Um, seem, you know, how could that be? How could that be a bad thing? Um, but again, it depends on what people are willing to do to enforce it or how they might interpret it. Um, uh, you know, so clearly, um, you know, Jesus 
experience some of that tension around the adultery one, right? So trying to think about how do you respond to someone accused of adultery. Um, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, um, <laughs> uh, I, you know, it, it, it uses a ancient formula um, that you can that you see in some of the older psalms, etc. Um, uh, this uh, litany of benediction, um, but uh, you know, blessed are the meek, for they inher they'll inherit the earth. Why can't that be a summoning to uprising? Jesus did say he came with a sword, not to bring peace, but with a sword. So which parts do you want to read and how do you want to interpret them? Um, is there something inherently, inherently dangerous in uplifting the downtrodden, which is much of what the Sermon on the Mount wants to do? And yes, in a good dangerous way, right? In the way that Jubilee would. Um, it's hugely disruptive. Let's talk about racial privilege, right? If we're actually going to, race, to, to dismantle white supremacy in the United States, it's going to be hugely disruptive. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Um, uh, we should, but it is dangerous. Again, in these complex, multi, um, polymorphous kinds of ways. Uh, the next question, uh, my question is about the dangers lurking in our own progressive religious closets. What do you see as the most serious of these? That's part one. If you want to answer that, and then I, there's a part two. Sometimes when it's not set up as a webinar, but as a meeting, I will ask at the outset or somewhere in the middle. Usually, often I'll ask at the outset what name a dangerous religious idea while we're waiting to start. And, and a lot of times it falls into that instinct that the first thing that comes to mind is somebody else's religious idea. But then later on, I'll ask, you know, what about one of our, your own, right? So I shared my commitment around pluralism, my assumptions around gender equality. Um, uh, but um, one, during one of the presentations, um, the clergy person at the church said, lifted up an interesting example and said, our efforts at inclusion are dangerous because, and she unfolded this story, they're an open and affirming church and a member of the church um, can't get his mind and spirit around that commitment and committed some anti-LGBTQ vandalism in the church. And she said, Do, does our commitment to inclusion include this man? Um, uh, philosophers have grappled with this a little bit and you know, what tolerance, what the tolerance of dangerous ideas. And then I think that that are, are and I'll talk, this is perhaps also a good transition to the second part, but I do think in the public square, where we have too long tolerated dangerous religious ideas is perhaps, I think the question was, what do I see as most dangerous? Um, I, I think in a complex way, our commitment to tolerance is the most fraught because we tolerate some things that are deeply harmful to people. The second half of the question, uh, and compared to the dangers that have led to say white nationalism, how do we avoid praising with faint dams? <laughs> okay, let me get my mind on that. Damning with faint praise. <laughs> praising with faint dams. Okay, so this is actually related to where that other question I think left off. Um, uh, I, I think we need a lot more practice in how to critique each other's ideas and our own in the public square. I think we're really bad at it. One of the things about religious ideas that is kind of different than other ideas that have the same power, like fire to be good and bad, is that religious ideas often get a pass, right? Um, we think that the freedom of religion means we can't say anything bad or we will praise with faint dance. <laughs> 
Um, so I, I don't have the answer. I mean, I, I wrote, for instance, a what I thought was a very respectful critique of Christian nationalism um, that relied on intra-religious foundations of the Christians Against Christian Nationalism group and the work that they're doing. Um, and I was very specific that this is not about Christianity, right? And, but I got, and I was trying to, to model constructive engagement in willing to speak up against ideas that we consider harmful that come out of religious spaces. And, um, and I got, you know, I don't get hate mail for most of my op-eds, but I got a <laughs> fair, fair amount of hate mail on that one, especially once it entered the right wing um, radio world, which I hadn't anticipated. I published it in USA Today so that people would think about it who didn't normally even, may not even know what Christian nationalism was, hadn't given it a moment's thought. So it wasn't like I deliberately didn't do it in the New York Times, but um, I wasn't expecting it you know, to show up in the right wing radio world, talk radio. Um, so uh, I, I think that we will do it badly sometimes, um, but I do think that not doing it is also dangerous. So I'd much rather try to do it well, learn from our mistakes um, and, and learn to listen um, and to understand other people's perspectives. That's kind of getting off track from the question. So I'll stop. I think probably the last question, uh, one that interests me having been a judge with criminal jurisdiction for 20 years, but this is not my question. Uh, the question is, would you comment on the scripture, an eye for an eye? So I actually talk about this in the book. Um, what's interesting about it is that already by the time, before Jesus starts preaching, it is not understood as retributive justice in Jewish circles. So he had learned that it was not you know, I poke out your eye and you poke out mine, but rather was uh, understood as restorative justice, that you're required to support uh, for the medical care and for loss of income. And, you know, there are five different categories in which you're required to uh, support the um, person who suffered the loss of the eye. Um, and lots of debates uh, around, you know, how to judge things, um, uh, fairly in this, how to, you know, how can you put a monetary value on some of these things and dealing with some of those complexities. So this is already deeply embedded in the Jewish tradition. And it's really interesting that that complexity gets lost um, in certainly in today's world in the United States and the carceral state. Um, I would argue that our, our natural human instinct for retributive for retribution, I wouldn't call it justice, for retribution is fed far more powerfully by films than by scripture. Nonetheless, people who don't necessarily cite scripture all that often, cite the eye for an eye thing um, as if that is the sum total of what religion had to teach about justice and it's just not so. And their citing of it is inconsistent, right? Because they don't really mean eye for an eye and if you, you know, it, certainly Americans who quote it would look at uh, uh, the rare instances where there is physical punishment, like the loss of a hand for stealing kinds of things in some um, Muslim majority nations. Uh, you know, that's, that's barbarism. But somehow when it comes to the death penalty, they like it, right? So, um, so anyway, so it's not consistent. And the religious traditions have this robust thinking, deep thinking about justice that is not, not only is it not only retributive, but also restorative, it also is distributive, right? It's also about, you can't have justice if the person is forced to steal because they have nothing to eat, right? So economic justice is part of justice. Um, and so, uh, I think, again, we've stripped the traditions of their complexity and that part of our job is to recover that. Well, thank you. And uh, let's 
go into the second half of the presentation. Okay, and I think this will address the question that I tabled. And if not, they, we can ask it again. So um, I explained in the book that I was raised in the tradition of drum rolls, and probably many of you were as well, uh, believing that, that we should utilize public reason rather than religious beliefs in arguing a policy position. So for a lot of my life, many progressives kind of forfeited the public religious voice. And it wasn't for lack of religious conviction, but rather for this liberal commitment to pluralism and to Rawlsian public reason. Unfortunately, it gave the erroneous impressions that political liberalism is hostile to religion and that religious voices were being pushed out of the public debate and that religious increasingly meant conservative. So as a political and a religious progressive, I don't want to relinquish the public voice of religion to people who try to use it to deny individuals access to public services or reject climate science or legislate bias or limit our responsibilities to support the disadvantaged. At the same time, I, the separation of religion and state serves a vital role in preserving American democracy and creates a broad space for spirituality to flourish in all of its polymorphous beauty. And as a religious minority, as a Jew, I'm grateful for the disestablishment of Protestantism, which is an ongoing project, a bumpy project, kind of some, you know, one step forward, two steps back sometimes. But I'm concerned as a minority that legally privileged religious voices impinge on the liberties of others. But ultimately, I advocate a conversation model in public discourse rather than one of strict separation. It's a conversation where you won't be surprised to hear this. I want to see religious ideas critically engaged. And this has two directions, at least. Right? One is self-critical public discussion and civil debate about other people's ideas. Because religious ideas do matter too much to give them a pass. So one of my favorite examples of uh, current examples of self-critical faith is a blog post by Reverend Rob Shank. I don't know if any of you remember that name. He's an evangelical leader who with his brother basically began the anti-abortion movement. I don't know if you remember, but evangelical Christianity supported Roe v. Wade when it was first issued. It's surprising to many people, but no religious idea has always meant what we think it means today. So Shank last fall wrote this series about what's going wrong with evangelical Christianity. And one of them was about abortion. And he wrote that he talked about how he himself lost sight of the welfare of pregnant women. And then he lost sight of the greatest commandments of loving God and loving neighbor. And he lost sight of all the things that are required to be pro-life, including life beyond the womb. And he got, got caught up in the culture wars, he says, and in the rightness of his cause and the glorification of his own reputation, and that he birthed, helped to birth a movement that was evidently not pursuing the common good because it resorts to violence, it's abandoned so many of its other commitments, and he still believes that fetal life should be protected, but not at the expense of women, and he's now willing to sort of grapple with that tension. And he also began to explore what Judaism says about the beginnings of life because he sees it rightly as the faith of Jesus. Although a lot of what Judaism says is rabbinic Judaism that developed perhaps some of it after, a lot of it after Jesus. Um, but by saying such things in the public square, other people's ideas are obviously also implicated, but as self-critique, it is so powerful. It, it, he makes the point way more effectively than somebody had always been, you know, only uh, pro-choice might be able to. And he also reveals an intra-faith diversity that challenges bias we might have around evangelical Christianity. So I think an important aspect of moving religious discourse forward in the public square is revealing the multivocality inside our traditions and communities and stop sort of totalizing and essentializing everything, um, that we can demonstrate the knowledge for nuance and for self-critique and not easy answers and, and not, you know, not everything kind of provisional and trying to live in the tensions um, and also acknowledge the possibility of change. Uh, 
that Reverend Shank's post definitely demonstrates. So the second part, the part about uh, civil debate regarding other people's religious ideas, that can be tricky. Um, it can easily give voice to religious bias. But as I said earlier, I think silence is dangerous too. So I'd rather try to do it well. So there are two things I mentioned. Well, I'll mention two things that are that are in the book. One is um, Kathleen Cavaney's cool distinction between condemn and contemn, right? It's only one little letter, but we can passionately disagree with somebody's religious ideas. We can condemn them, but we can do it without contempt for the people who hold them. We can do it without demonizing our adversary. Um, we're not very good at that as the question that I tabled indicates. We have, are in deeply polarized society, um, but, but we can model it. We can try to model it. So one of my favorite examples that's in the book is Diana Eck, who um, takes on the Southern Baptists when they publish a pamphlet about Hinduism. Um, and you can imagine that it was not a particularly flattering um, take on Hindu traditions. And she wrote to them and then publicly, as a scholar of Hinduism, I say, I must say that you've seriously misrepresented the Hindu tradition. And I'd be happy to speak with you about where I think your portrayal is misleading. As an American and fellow citizen, however, I'll defend your right to believe and practice Christianity as you do, to believe the worst about our Hindu neighbors, to believe they're all going to hell and to say so both privately and publicly. But as a Christian, let me challenge you here. For I believe that your views of our neighbors are not well grounded in the gospel of Christ as I understand it. So um, she speaks from the tradition and not for it. She uses her expertise to challenge them, but doesn't demonize them. She says, come, let's study together, right? She affirms their freedom, which is very important um, value for people speaking from what has been called the religious right. Um, as intra-faith critique, it matters quite a bit. Um, and this is one of the reasons I so like the Christians Against Christian Nationalism effort. I, I'm happy to be an ally in it, but it really needs to be led by Christians like, like the um, uh, BJC, uh, the Baptist Joint Committee. Um, so uh, religion shows up in all kinds of ways in the public square. In the book, I talk about a bunch. Um, there's anti-Muslim bias embedded in media, in political campaigns, in policies like the Muslim ban, and in the critique of, you know, of anti-Muslim bias and policies, like through the protests around the Muslim ban. Um, there are political leaders who periodically invoke scripture to support their ethics and policy positions. We see it in American exceptionalism and the ways that that permeates uh, political speech and becomes like our civil religion. Uh, we see it iconog iconographically, right? I could take a Torah scroll to a protest march and by doing so, I'd be arguing that its teachings align with my cause, just as those marching with Jesus saves banners at the Capitol riot were claiming for theirs. Um, Interreligious encounters play out in public discourse, public policy, public services, public space, public schools. Um, and we bump into each other all the time, even when we want to get along, there are, you know, the irreducible differences sometimes actually do present real challenges we have to navigate in public square together. Um, an important and continuing public conflict is how we interpret and apply the laws of religious liberty. Um, there's a case that I've been watching, I've been waiting for the decision for a long time. Uh, it was argued the day after election day, Fulton v. Philadelphia that went before the Supreme Court. It's a case where Catholic Social Services wants to keep its city contract for foster care, even though it won't certify same-sex couples as foster parents. Um, uh, those of you who might have seen the Bethany case, not a Supreme Court case, but where Bethany uh, Adoption Services decided they would finally certify same-sex couples. These are the similar tensions that have been playing out around the country. So this is Philadelphia's case. I believe that 
Catholic Social Services is entitled to believe that parents should be a heterosexual couple, but that they have to seek an equilibrium between their religious convictions and the public interest in non-discrimination, as well as the interests of foster children where there are never enough loving homes, including a lot of LGBTQ identified kids who got kicked out when their parents suspected something around their gender sexuality that they could not stand. So um, I, I would argue that the CSS case, that their claim does not advance the freedom of religion. What it's asking to do is enshrine a freedom to discriminate. Um, it would exempt religious agencies that receive taxpayer funding from laws designed to protect minorities and marginalized individuals. It would allow them to turn away people that don't abide by their religious values. Um, protecting religious freedom does not mean privileging above, it above all other things, but they're likely to win in the Supreme Court, despite having lost at the circuit and appellate level. So Reza Aslan and um, Cory Walker and I have a, an op-ed ready to go at the Los Angeles Times, ready to complain about it if, uh, if we're right. Um, but I actually think, in, in addition to thinking they should lose the case, but they won't, I wonder whether it wouldn't have been so much better if we could address this outside the court system. Because in the courts, there always has to be a winner and a loser. And the goal is to live together without doing harm to each other. How do we do that? Can we figure that out together? I think the case illuminates a specific instance of a principle I think is worthy of consideration. Um, I work with Robert Audi's fancy name, uh, Theoethical Equilibrium. He says, where religious considerations appropriately bear on matters of public morality or political choice, religious people have a prima facie obligation to seek an equilibrium between those considerations and relevant secular standards of ethics and political responsibility. So I take this to mean it's not a matter of translation like Rawls would have us. We can bring our religious ideas into the public square. We can talk about them in those terms but it requires balancing what our religion teaches with a plural understanding of the broader public good. It requires that we stand inside and outside our life stance to examine its impact. It requires, you won't be surprised, self-critical faith and reclaiming the complexities of our traditions and commitment to the common good of a diverse society. So let me stop there and take some of your questions and thoughts about the role of religion in public life. All right. Um, there are uh, no questions presented on my uh, chart yet, uh, although I anticipate there will be some. So let me ask a question, possibly a little off the topic, but it's one that interests me greatly. And that's my concern about the impact of scripture as a trump card anytime there's a discussion. If books of the Bible are written by humans, uh, parentheses men, uh, and they're really man's attempt to define God, to know God, and to describe God to others. And they're not the inerrant direct word of God. Why do we call it sacred? Why do we call them sacred? And uh, why are the books of the Bible any more important than, say, uh, one of the books by Marcus Borg or Bishop uh, Spong or uh, Paul Tillich? Um, so this, these were questions I was trying to get at some in the sermon and I see it, it definitely hit um, an interest of yours uh, yeah. and something that you've been thinking about for quite some time. So um, I do think that we, uh, that part of what makes them sacred is this um, collective enduring transmission 
of engagement with these words, right? Something that we've been working at and unpacking and adding to in our own way, like through interpretation um, for millennia with each other, right? So, um, and so it is that, I mean, the way I like to think about it as sacred, it is, it is this lifelong course in moral and spiritual development. I actually don't think scripture tries to define God, although uh, the other verbs I think I would agree with. Mostly it's about these are our diverse experiences of God and they're really different. And I think even in our own individual lives, we've experienced God in diverse ways. And, and so part of its sanctity is this multiplicity, right? That it speaks not only to a single individual's momentary numinous experience of the divine, but our collective existence, right? A, a people trying to figure out together what it is to become a covenanted community. Um, uh, and, um, and so, you know, you, you could look as, as I say in the sermon for a better good book, right? But I, but you wouldn't have this tradition of thousands of years for most of these scriptures, right? For the ones that I deal with and Quran is the newest and it's still got quite a bit of collected wisdom and effort to say, what is this really trying to teach us? What does it say about how we can live our lives and what gives them meaning and purpose? What's, who are we? What do we owe to each other? What's our relationship with the divine? There are multiple answers, even within a single scripture. And, um, and that the sanctity is the abiding commitment as a community to continue to grapple with the word. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. It sounds like our cities and towns could use a Mars Hill, obviously written by someone familiar with scripture. What might be a possible venue in our communities? Um, I'm not sure I completely understood the question. Um, a possible venue, I mean, I assume we're talking about Paul's speech on Mars Hill, um, but uh, I don't think they asked about the speech so much as Mars Hill is an example of a public forum in ancient Greece. What, okay. what might be possible venue in today's communities? Okay, I was trying to think. What, you know, are we looking for what Paul did? No, we're looking. We're the questions about. Can we create a space where somebody can publicly come and proclaim and challenge and, um, you know, and, and it's not, it's not just Mars. They were, I mean, Paul, the epistles are interesting examples of, you know, trying to engage in self-critical faith with diverse communities too, um, in uh, flawed, but important and sometimes beautifully transformative ways. Um, so uh, do we have, could, could we have a Mars Hill? So, I mean, I think we have in a, I, I don't think we have a single site, right? In, in our world, there are people and places that can have transformative impact on broader religious discussion. So you can think about something like Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si around climate crisis. Um, that didn't start the conversation, but has a important transformative impact on the conversation, especially inside the Catholic church, although there's lots of resistors, there's also a lot of structure. So I think in, to, to build it in and to build upon it. So, um, so I think in our world, which is so big and has so much noise, you know, it, it can't be reduced to a single site and it can't be reduced to a single speech, but could we cultivate spaces where we 
are willing to engage you know, in self-critical ideas. This is not a new idea. In addition to Mars Hill, we also have the Majlis in medieval Islam, where the sort of political leaders would convene gatherings of diverse religious leaders. And the rule was everybody gets to, you, you can't prove your point by, by citing your scripture, right? You have to argue it in a way that would make sense to diverse people. And go ahead, make your case for why your tradition is so beautiful, so important, so meaningful. Um, and everybody was supposed to be treated with respect. Now, of course, sometimes that's flawed in, it, in its historical embodiment, but there's this great journal of a guy, not from the multicultural cities where it was unfolding, but from the countryside um, who did come to one and it, it was tolerant enough that he couldn't stand it. <laughs> so he left. So um, yes, I think we need to cultivate more of those spaces. Um, you know, we can do it with interreligious work, we can do it inside our congregations, we can do it in the public square. Um, uh, I think that, uh, you know, there are some websites that are trying to be those spaces um, uh, for engaged conversation around religious ideas and their impact, but I, I think we need to be involved and invested in, in those spaces to help shape conversations that are, you know, that could be transformative, that could change the way we talk about religion in the public square. Next question uh, is going to be difficult uh, to have an answer, I think. Uh, it says, it asks, I see little equilibrium on religious questions in state legislatures and in many recent Supreme Court decisions. How can we continue to engage in a sphere that seems to close out other voices? So, um, I, I agree. Um, I, I think the pendulum is swinging in a way, uh, or has been for, uh, for quite some time, swinging in a way that, um, that makes it hard to imagine recovering an equilibrium or finding an equilibrium. Um, uh, but I, I think we have to struggle against the winner take all approach. Um, and like Diana Eck did, try to affirm the con some of the concerns of people on the other side. Um, so that rather, you know, we still have to be fighting for equilibrium. We still have to be fighting for a common good, not only our good um, in order to shift that. Um, but uh, we are, our voices, I think at this moment in time, um, are poised to have more of an impact. I think that the religious right has um, done so much that is publicly dis disruptive and destructive um, that now is the time to lift up our voices. And when you have religious voices um, on that are equally heard, if you will, on diverse issues, and I think that we can begin to seek greater equilibrium. Equilibrium is, will always be provisional. It'll always be, um, you know, vulnerable to being toppled over again. Um, uh, but I do think that uh, we are at a moment where we actually can begin to move toward it. So, you know, this is different than court packing, which I also want to do. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, we, we can say that the conservative majority on the court doesn't reflect the equilibrium of the perspectives of the country. Um, and pack the court in order to achieve greater equilibrium. But I also understand that as political strategy that looks and feels like a winner take all, you know, I'm trying to get power for the progressive voice. Um, so, you know, our sense of what equilibrium is, we don't even see equilibrium the same way, I guess is what I, part of the problem. Uh, following up on that, <clears throat> the questioner writes, Public discourse in recent years has been so loud 
and so angry, and frankly, from my perspective, so wrong-headed that I find it almost impossible to find within myself sources of tolerance and understanding. Do you have any suggestions about how to tap the self-critical spirit needed for these much needed public conversations? So there are some interesting projects that have begun. I don't know if any of you've heard of Faith Matters. Uh, Reverend Jen Bailey um, is working there. She's doing a number of things. Um, the whole team is, I just, I'm terrible with names and I can't remember the names of other folks, but I've met Jen, so I remember her name. So, um, and I mentioned this particular organization, but these are the kinds of efforts that I think can be replicated in other spaces too. And also that can be brought into work that you're trying to do in your own, in your own communities. So um, one of them is that they're doing resilience training for people doing movement work. Right? It's exhausting, um, right? Um, you know, most of movement work is thankless and you don't even know if you're gonna see the triumph and it's really hard. And, um, and how, do you, how do you sustain your spirit in that work? And so there's resilience work for movement leaders and also spiritual, you know, people are looking at being, I have, we have students at CTS who are looking to be chaplains for the for movement work. Um, but Faith Matters is also working on a project of gathering people in community who don't see eye to eye on particular issues, usually around political difference, um, and guiding them in civil conversation. There are other projects like this, the dinner project, is it dinner, is it dinner? I can't remember the name of it. There's another one that actually grew out of they worked with Faith Matters for a little while. Um, it grew out of actually just wanting to get people to talk together about grief at dinner, you know, at sort of over supper. Um, but it grew to get people to talk about other things as too. So there are um, small projects to bring neighbors together, right? And I think that's that's the key. And you know, in places like Florida. You, you know, I don't live in a particularly politically diverse space in downtown Chicago, but um, uh, but even here, um, you know, we have uh, some of those differences we can help to navigate. And certainly in a place like Florida, you've got them. So um, there are, so the question I think was about how can you even like stand to go into those spaces because they're so angry and they're so, so another tool in those spaces, um, that I really like to use is narrative. So one of the most effective um, conversa public conversations I've ever seen around abortion was bringing, I think it was all women, um, bringing women together. And um, it, obviously on different sides of the issue regarding reproductive rights and Nobody could argue a case. You could only tell a story about somebody whose life was impacted. Um, and what it did was put a human face on people who thought very differently about something that they considered to be hugely important. Um, but it allowed uh, them to cultivate, allowed us to cultivate compassion for people on the other side to see that they are moral actors too. Um, and that the real challenge is not who's gonna win, but how do we live together? Um, and uh, so there are tools out there, but I absolutely affirm it's exhausting. It often makes us wanna just avoid public spaces um, and difficult conversations, but nothing changes unless we do it. Thank you. Uh, another question. <clears throat> you mentioned the BJC as a positive example. Could you expand on that? What do they do and how? So I don't know if a whole bunch of you know some of the history. I imagine that many of you do, right? That the Baptists in early and colonial America um, suffered a lot of discrimination. They became sort of historically rooted in fights for um, religious liberty 
And so they have this, um, the Baptist Joint Committee on, what's the formal name on, oh, I can't believe I've forgotten this. Um, Amanda Tyler just came, she's the executive director. She just came and spoke at CTS with me. Uh, anyway, I'm not sure it's important. You can look it up. Uh, if you look up BJC and Amanda Tyler, you get the whole name. But anyway, they have several projects um, related to religious pluralism and religious liberty. But the one on Christians against Christian nationalism, they've published a statement um, trying to explain why it's a distortion of both Christianity and American constitutional democracy. They, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, that was Mary Lee putting it in the uh, for religious liberty. So it's the Baptist Joint Committee for religious liberty. Um, uh, so a statement about why it's a distortion of both constitutional democracy and Christianity, um, how it is in fact idolatrous in form um, and expression and why it's dangerous to Christianity as well as to the rest of America. Um, and they got all kinds of Christian leaders to sign on and then had opened it in public you know, just thousands and thousands, I don't remember what the number is now, but thousands of Christians um, have signed the statement uh, and they're very public. They've, you know, put out um, op-eds and, um, uh, and public discussions um, regarding Christian nationalism. Uh, they were early, right? And a lot of people suddenly are paying attention after the Capitol riot, but, um, but it's a phenomenon long before that and expressed in ways that aren't necessarily violent, but still fraught. Um, and they've been working on this, I think since 2017. Um, uh, they work in partnership with scholars and activists who are also trying to educate people. Um, there are a couple important books, uh, one by Samuel Perry and John Whitehead Another one by Kathleen. Oh gosh, I told you I'm terrible with names. Um, uh, it'll come to me in a minute. But um, uh, that are come about Christian nationalism. Whitehead and Perry do a lot of poll work, um, uh, polling to figure out how you know they're trying to do evidence based. How is it shaping people's attitudes around uh, certain things? Um, uh, Kathleen's book is more uh, historical in perspective and sort of how these ideas developed and what's the strain that's been coming through and how is it being expressed today. Um, so again, I think with public voice and partnership, they're being very effective in trying to say religious liberty isn't always about church getting a meet in the middle of a pandemic or um, uh, you know, or people getting to discriminate against LB LGBTQ individuals, right? That's not what we think religious liberty really needs to be about. And here's what we're focused on. And they do a very good job bringing a progressive set of uh, values and commitments around religious liberty. Thank you very much, uh, Rabbi Mikva. There are no more questions. So uh, I think that ends our session today. Uh, I want to remind everybody, don't forget tomorrow, uh, Dr. Mikva will make a presentation on pursuing justice and peace for Israel and Palestine. Uh, something uh, very topical and a, a hot button issue uh, in the world today. So uh, thank you very much for attending and we'll see you all tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.